All right, so last time um, we made this first step to start talking about momentum transport, or momentum transferring systems. Uh, we made the point that um, the conservation equations that we have dealt with so far have been conservation of mass only. Mass is a, a scalar quantity. And with that, we, could, uh, we didn't derive, but we end up with the advection diffusion equation, where the constituent relationships that we use are fixed uh, fix law for diffusion, and also just a straight definition of advection being uh, carried by the bulk motion of the fluid. Uh, likewise, uh, maybe strangely, when we deal with uh, fluid flow problems, the, we also only satisfy um, conservation of mass. And so what we do is we take conservation of mass, we define conservation of mass in terms of Darcy's law, in that the velocity of flow is driven by a pressure gradient, and we can write the conservation of mass equation, conservation of volume equation, in terms of pressures. And so uh, Darcy's law in that particular case is what allows us to kind of solve for momentum transfer, because we're um, equ equilibrating against uh, viscous losses on the sides of the, the differential volume that we have. But if you want to solve momentum uh, transfer rigorously, then we have to uh, use F, F equals ma. Uh, and from that comes either uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, which we talked about last time and solved heuristically by being able to figure out which are the zeroth order, first order, and second order in space um, PDEs what they look like in terms of the uh, final element statements for those, and just assembled them, kind of clutching it together, but ultimately it worked, and we, we showed that it worked with the, the one example. Um, we went through one example uh, for this flow in a parallel-sided uh, uh, duct, and got pretty close to the results. Uh, you can also try, if you wanted to, uh, to use Comsol to be able to solve the same problem. Uh, encourage you to do that. I was thinking about doing it today, but that's not going to be uh, our task. So we'll we'll maybe move on and do something else. And so so the next thing to talk about is now the converse problem of conservation of momentum, and that is when we're dealing with instead of a fluid, um, when well, we made the point last time that when we're dealing with a fluid, the constitutive relationship we have is that stresses are related to um, velocities by uh, viscosity or, or a gradient of uh, velocities uh, in the same way as you can think of a strain. And so in other words, if you apply a stress to something, you end up developing a velocity in the fluid as a function of applying that stress. The converse, uh, if you deal with a solid, the converse constitutive law, uh, we'll end up writing it this way, is that if you look at applied stresses to a particular system, then they're related by terms that look like not um, rates of changes of uh, velocity in space, but rates of change of displacement surface. And so the big picture view is you take a solid, you add a force to it, it deforms, deforms instantly, and you get a deformation. If you take a fluid, you add a force to it or a stress to it, it deforms as a velocity and sets up a steady velocity as long as that force is applied to the system. So the only thing by which momentum transfer differs between a fluid and a solid, Navier-Stokes equations for fluid, is through the constitutive equation, nothing else. And so that's worth uh, keeping in mind. Uh, we didn't derive the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, the equivalent uh, expressions for conservation of momentum with the constitutive uh, equations added into them are the Navier, Navier, Navier equations of elasticity. Uh, and we won't use those either, but we'll use a much uh, more straightforward approach to looking at solid mechanics. And uh, when we started talking about this class uh, well, nine weeks ago, whenever it was, ten weeks ago, I guess, if you include spring break, uh, we talked about the origination of finite element methods uh, was driven by this paper by uh, Ray Clough, 
in the 1950s, and also at the same time a guy working in Germany called Argyris. And the way that the origin of the fine element method, which has now been applied to all kinds of physical systems, was, was derived by the principle of virtual work. So what we'll do today is we'll talk about that very physically based uh, discussion of how to get the fine element equations, um, and we'll apply it for one-dimensional element, and then we'll apply it for ultimately a, uh, our triangular element. So we'll do the same thing that we've done in the past, and that is we'll work from the simplest geometry we can imagine, which as it turns out ends up being exactly the same as the, the, the Darcy flow equations we have for one-dimensional behavior. Because in one dimension we only have one degree of freedom, it happens to be a vectoral degree of freedom of displacement, but there is only one degree of freedom, and then it gets a bit more complicated when we start talking about two-dimensional elements. So, so that's the uh, the kind of background to what we'll do. Um, you'll recall that in everything we've done so far, uh, we've been thinking about this matrix. We haven't really got to use it very much yet. I guess we used it a little bit when we talked about um, mass transport, uh, because we could use the flow equation to get the velocity field and then use that velocity field to be able to put into the advective part of the advection dispersion equation or diffusion equation. Um, uh, but we really haven't started filling in what these other components would be. We're still kind of working on the, uh, the diagonal. And when we're dealing with solid mechanics, uh, then what we're dealing with are rates of changes of displacement. So these would be velocities and applied rates of changes of forces. Of course, you could just integrate in time to get these as displacements and forces, which is really what we'll do. And they're linked through by some expression, which is a, uh, I often use the term, been using, trying to train myself to use the term conductance matrix, but this is a stiffness matrix. And it's not just a single term, but it's a matrix of however many degrees of freedom we have in, in the system. And so we've talked a little bit about that. Um, you recall that when we deal with flow problems, we deal with something that looks like this. Uh, flow Volumetric flow rates are related to heads or pressures. We've typically used uh, heads. Or if we're looking at mass transport, we're looking at mass flow rates are related to gradients of concentrations. And so the expression that we end up with for solid mechanics is not so different in that we're still solving a system of linear, linear system of equations um, that link some dependent variable to another uh, defined uh, nodal degree of freedom. The only thing that's going to be different is that um, as we saw last time when we talked about finite element, uh, so, sorry, Navier-Stokes equations, is that if we look at each node, then we're going to have displacements in two directions and correspondingly forces applied in each of those two directions as well if we have an x and y global coordinate system. And so it's a bit more complicated in the same way it was for Navier-Stokes last time. We have to think about um, uh, vectoral, vectoral variables. But what we'll find out is that the end result of our little derivation is that we end up with a, a stiffness matrix, which looks, looks remarkably similar to other things that we've seen. I won't de define these things now because we'll do them in, in, in due course. But uh, we end up with something that looks exactly the same as the conductance matrix we had for either um, potential flow or for diffusion without the advective component where these matrices are slightly different. And of course, this constitutive matrix, instead of being uh, Darcy's law in this case, or Fick's law in this case, is actually Hooke's law. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll derive that in due course. Okay. The, well, the other thing that perhaps is worthwhile uh, revisiting is that you know we, we've made the point that um, you can solve finite element equations using a simulator that doesn't really discriminate between being one-dimensional or two-dimensional or three-dimensional, or being the same model that you might want to apply for flow problems and diffusion of problems and heat transfer problems 
and solid mechanics problems and Navier-Stokes problems and electro electrostatic uh, problems. And one of the reasons that that is able to work is that we're basically solving the same uh, sequence of uh, conditions to be able to define our physical system. And so we need to satisfy a conservation law. We need to have some variables which we make sure are continuous in the system. We need to have a constitutive law. And then we need to apply boundary conditions to it. And those are generic uh, requirements that we put. In the flow systems, mass in equals mass out in steady state. Continuity is that if we take the derivatives of the heads or the concentrations, then they need to be finite because otherwise we can't get this A matrix in each of these. We have a constituent relationship which is either Darcy's law or Fick's law or Hooke's law. Each of these laws relate a component to a derivative of a component. So strains are something like, well, are, are, of, the, are of the form rate of change of uh, displacement in space. This is a rate of change of head in space. And this is a rate of change of concentration in space. So these are, are really very similar laws in terms of their, uh, their format. And then once you have that, you apply boundary conditions, initial conditions, and, and solve the system equations. And so that's the underlying reason now that we, we uh, expect that we can be able to solve um, complex problems for different physical systems with the same code. I mean, they just conform to the same behaviors. The other thing that we realize uh, is that we end up with uh, matrices that look the same. So we'll re revisit this maybe after we've gone through it, but when we're dealing with solid mechanics, the stiffness matrix that we want to be able to define behavior in is exactly the same form as it was for uh, flow. The only difference is that the component matrices are linking different things. Component matrices link heads at nodes to gradients of heads, displacements at nodes to gradients of displacements in this. And the constituent relationship links gradients of heads to flow velocities. Uh, that's our kind of fake momentum bounds part of uh, defining momentum bounds, because otherwise we're just solving a, a, um, a continuity equation. And here this links displacement gradients to stresses. I suppose if this was a fluid and you wanted to, to write this out in an equivalent form, it would look something like this. Right? This is a, a, dis, a strain rate, which is really what dv dx, dvy dx is. And so, I mean, there's, there's a certain commonality in, in these behaviors that we can exploit and is perhaps uh, useful to get the, the big picture for. So anyway, so uh, the first uh, final element methods came out of looking at uh, a very uh, physical approach to derive this, the, the governing equations. And the approach was basically to use the idea of internal virtual work being the same as external virtual work. And so the, the idea is quite straightforward. It means if you take a, a body and you have it in your hands and you squeeze it, then you apply some force onto the outside. And the force that you apply on the outside multiplied by the displacement it goes through is the amount of work you're putting into this. And so if you're not burning that up in terms of heat somehow, then that has to be stored inside the, the solid. And it's stored by the fact that it's become slightly compressed and that it therefore has internal strain energy. And so the principle of virtual work is merely saying that if you do work on something on the outside of it, then the amount of work you do on the outside has to be resident inside it, nothing more than that. And so it merely says that the, uh, well, you can read it out here. An elastic body is in equilibrium. In other words, it satisfies F equals MA. I guess this isn't. If accelerations are zero, then the sum of forces on the system in equilibrium means it's not a moving, it's not accelerating, it could be going at some velocity. An acid body is in equilibrium if for any set of virtual displacements, the virtual work of the external forces is equal to the virtual strain energy of the system. That's basically saying what I said. So you do work on something on the outside, it has to be resident only in the inside. You take a beaker, you raise it up 
a foot it has some new potential energy. It has the, the amount of work you have to do on it to do that has to be equivalent to the amount of new energy it has uh, by putting it up to a foot or so. And so what we do is we take our domain and we, not surprisingly, divide it into um, a number of small subregions. This is true for the whole body, but it's also true for every single piece of the body that we take, and we write this at the individual, at the element level. So each, um, I'm not sure what M stands for, element number M, um, and that is that the external work has to equal the internal work. And so the way that we can define that is exactly the same way as we defined our elements before. We have a number of nodes. In this particular case, it would be node 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and because we have more than one degree of freedom per node now, then we have to be mindful of the fact that we should accommodate that somehow. And the the protocol that's been used, I guess you could do it in a variety of different ways, but the standard protocol that's used is to basically number the uh, degrees of freedom as degree of freedom 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Remember last time when we did Navier-Stokes, you know, we had also in here we had at each node we also had a fluid pressure at element 1. And so if we were doing that, as we rearrange the equations at the end of our calculation, we arranged them so they were node-centric. They started off as they were element-centric in the system, uh, or actually all the, the values for displacements in the velocities in the x-direction are together, velocities in the y-directions together, and velocity uh, pressures at the nodes were together. And we rejuggled them as we solved the system of equations before we solved it to be able to put them as uh, the, dis the velocity at node 1, the velocity in y at node 1, and the pressure at node 1. And then the next ones were numbered displacement in x, displacement in y, pressure, etc. So anyway, so we have a variety of uh, displacement degrees of freedom with the complementary forces that are applied to these uh, at each, each node as well. Um, they're aligned in the global coordinate directions, if you remember that. And we are going to basically take out a single element, as we've done, and we're going to look at the applying the principle of virtual work to that. And so straightforwardly, the principle of virtual work is just the magnitude of the boundary forces which are already there, which is an important concept to have, multiplied by the displacements they go through. So in other words, the idea is that if you take a, um, a block and it had some particular stiffness to it, and you applied a, a force to it, then you would plot with the displacement of this block here. And if you fix it at the bottom, you would get something like this, right? The gradient of this line uh, is really the stiffness of this. So what is it? Uh, F equals KU. So in other words, F over U is equal to K over 1. So this would be the stiffness here, and this would be 1 in this. But the, the bottom line is that if you add that force to it, the amount of strain energy you have here is going to be equal to a half times the force it goes through multiplied by the dis displacement. And so it's just the area underneath this curve is the amount of um, work you've done in the system. Force times displacement is uh, work, right? Newton meters. The difference with virtual displacements is that we're thinking that this thing already has a force on it. And that force is of some magnitude. And that when we now magically apply a displacement to it without changing this force, this force just moves through this displacement, and if we plotted the same graph here, it starts off with some force, it goes through some displacement, and the actual energy that's used is just the product of those, the whole area underneath this, uh, this curve. 
And so that's what we mean by virtual strains. Small, for, small displacement where there's a force already applied to it, uh, which is a follower force that allows us to be able to calculate the amount of, of virtual work in the system, virtual work. So we apply a force, push it through a displacement, and we get a magnitude of the virtual work. If we do it for our particular geometry here, then we could move each of these uh, degrees of freedom in turn through a unit displacement, if you like, with a follower force attached to it. And if we do that for each of the nodes, then we can define the displacements at each node, each degree of freedom. So this is at node 1. The next one's 2 would be at node 2, etc. There'd be 2 in each case. And the forces are the same forces that are the follower forces at node 1, etc. And so given that we have these magnitudes, then the virtual work that we've done is just the, the product of those forces times displacements. The forces aren't distributed. They're only applied at the nodes. And so the virtual work is merely the magnitude of the force at that point multiplied by the displacement of that uh, node, the overbar just being uh, defining as, as virtual. And so if you write that in, in matrix form, we end up with the external work that's done on the system is that. And so that's just the fact that you putting, have a load applied on it, you're putting through a small displacement, and as a result of that, you get this um, virtual work, which is defined as the error under this curve, which is just what equation one is. So we said that that has to equal the amount of energy that's inside it. And so we can define the, the amount of internal energy as equal to uh, the corollary of displacement is, for instance, that strain in the x direction is equal to the change in displacement over some length. So this is a change in displacement over length. So in other words, it's a it's a distributed quantity. You can define it at a, at a point also, but it is distributed throughout the element. And the stresses that are applied by uh, being applied to the system that these virtual strains are put through allows us to be able to define, oh, you can see an equivalence, right? Displacements and strains and forces and equivalent stresses are the equivalence of the conditions on the external boundary only at the nodes in one case and throughout the whole of the element in the other case. And so if we uh, look at defining the magnitude of the internal strain energy that's, that's completed, then we, we want to be able to figure out exactly what the internal strain energy is relative to these, these quantities here. Virtual displacements again, <coughs> hence the overbar here represents that. So for the stress or force is already applied, stress is already applied, and you put it through a virtual strain, and you get, and that virtual strain is occurring because of the virtual displacements on the boundaries. Right? So. And so we know that this is true for the whole system, but we're going to do it per element, I guess. Um, if we write Hooke's Law in terms of this, we haven't really talked about Hooke's Law in this class, but take it on trust that in the same way that we can relate through Darcy's law pressure gradients to f uh, volumetric f or flow fluxes, we can take strains and relate them to stresses. We apply a relationship which we don't know what it looks like yet, but let's take it on trust that, that there is some kind of relationship which will allow us to link nodal values of displacement to the strains within an element. So these are defined as the nodes, we already know what they look like because they we've talked about them here. They would be these things here. Not necessarily these things, but uh, the nodal displacements. And we think we know what strains are. And so what we can do is we can define virtual work. Virtual work is exactly the same as a virtual displacement multiplied by a force, which we dealt with before. But instead of being defined only at discrete points, we had nodal values where we had forces applied. And so when that node displaces, there's a product of a force times that displacement defines the amount of virtual work that's applied here. It's only physically at that point. But within our element, the strains and the stresses, the stresses that are applied and the strains that result are, if you like, distributed throughout the, the whole body in some way. 
And so the inter integration that we have to do is that the internal virtual work is just equal to the strains multiplied by the stresses, of which there are actually three, but let's not worry about that. But they also have to be integrated over the volume of that particular element, differential element, typically. And so the magnitudes of the, the virtual work is given by this. So it's directly equivalent to the discrete behavior at the nodes, but it's described throughout the element. And this, again, is, is virtual. So what now, then? If we take this and we substitute in here, and if we take this and we substitute in here, and if we take this and we substitute in here, then you, you get basically the, the virtual internal work expression. So this is uh, the constitutive law. This here is just including the magnitude of the strain. So in other words, this. If we then, uh, with this, substitute this into this relationship here, uh, then we end up with this term here is just this stress, right? So this is this. And if we resubstitute for this to, and take the transpose of it, then uh, we have this overall expression. These are uh, virtual strains. So these would be virtual strains are linked to virtual displacements, and hence the overbar here. And if we take this expression and we realize it's that the, uh, the transpose of a product is the same as the transpose of the original components turned backwards, just as a standard result, then these get uh, swapped on each other and made transposed. And you end up with this expression here. This, these two terms here, I'll erase that in a second, are just these ones. The displacements um, can be uh, taken out because they're defined only at a single point uh, on the boundary, right? Not within the volume. So they only exist at a single point, so they're discrete. So we can take that outside. Um, and the rest of the stuff we have. So we have an expression for internal virtual work. We have an expression for external work. We can equate the two of them. And if we do that, then we end up being able to get rid of this on both sides, which we've taken, been able to take outside the integral. And we're left with an expression which actually looks rather similar to what we've seen before. And that is that we just have a stiffness matrix which links these two things. And it looks identical to what we had before. So it's actually amazing, I think. And, and the reason for that is, of course, well, um, actually, why, actually, why should it be the same? It's, why should the... Um, the magnitude, why should the form of this matrix as the, the derivatives of the shape functions and uh, constitutive law be the same uh, as it is, say, for the, the flow problem? The principal reason is that it's, uh, it, this represents you know, second order uh, derivatives. And the Navier equation involves second order derivatives. I won't write it out because I, I can't write it out right now without referring to it. But basically, this is a second-order derivative, which would be the same as it's a second order of displacement as a function of x, and some more complicated terms. But it's basically the same. Same as in Navier-Stokes, when we're solving Stokes flow, we uh, we really we threw the, gra uh, the the gravity terms away. The, we put the density as zero, and the only terms left were equations that included velocities changing in space, and therefore we had the same second-order what we called K, K Roman two uh, matrices. Uh, in that. Remember, we defined these matrices as the conductance matrix, but for second order terms, and we tried to split it up. So the bottom line is that we end up with a system of equations, again, AX equals B or F equals KU, where we relate forces to displacements through a matrix which we now know how to calculate. It's going to be this. And we've calculated before, and we can use that to be able to sol solve um, solid mechanics problems. We happen to have written it for an individual element that we've taken out of the whole system, 
but there's no reason why, in the same way as we did it for all of our other problems, you discretize and you solve, define it for one element, and then you put the building blocks together to be able to solve for a larger system. So that's basically the, the derivation for, for that. Relatively straightforward and very physical, physically based. Um, we can probably move quite quickly through how we use that because it starts repeating itself. It's very similar to what we've done already for, um, for flow problems. And so let's just do uh, something with a quick uh, one-dimensional element and figure out exactly what the element matrices look like for this very simple problem. It turns out to be very similar to something we've already seen. And the reason for that is that the uh, displacements that we have at the nodes are um, they are vectoral quantities. They have direction and magnitude, but because it's only a one-dimensional problem, and if it's oriented you know, in the directions of one of the, the principal axes, then you can't tell the fact that this is a vector versus a scalar, essentially. And so, uh, so it ends up being very similar to the systems we've had before. So we define a global system. This global system maybe is uh, a couple of elements with three nodes, which is a column, which we're going to apply a load to. Um, we need a template to represent one of these, so we take out one element and look at it. We define it in terms of its geometry, length, and cross-sectional area. We define it in terms of nodal degrees of freedom of nodes 1 and 2 with one degree of freedom each. And then we start looking at what the, uh, the stiffness matrix would be that would contribute to that. Um, we know it's <coughs> this matrix, uh, which is a function of Hooke's law, which is very simple for this one-dimensional case. It's just uh, stress equals modulus times strain in the x direction. So this is epsilon x. It's, there's only one term in the, in the matrix. And the, uh, the strain relationship is also one-dimensional. Uh, this is only one component that represents this. And these happen to be the, the nodal degrees of freedom in the element of which there will be two. So we know that the A matrix is going to be 1 by 2, and this is going to be 2 by 1, or however you like to, to define your matrices. They have to be complementary to each other. And so we, we start being able to assemble this. We know that this Hooke's law is given by just one term. Um, we need to be able to figure out exactly the magnitudes of these uh, uh, gradient derivatives of the shape function terms, uh, which is really what links displacements to strains. So in other words, this operator is going to be something that takes a chosen displacement at the nodes and gives us a, a gradient for it, displacement gradient. And so the way that we've done that before in the past is you could do it a couple of ways. You could define shape functions and map using shape functions, or you could just use an equivalent shape function that gives, just gives you, defines uh, displacement as a function of, um, in this case, distance in the y direction. Oops, function of y. And so if you do that, um, we define, this is our shape functions defined a little differently. This is a displacement. This is the displacement of node 1, and this is the displacement of node 2. If you look at it, we said when we talked about shape functions, the only essential thing they have to do is they have to be 1 at the node in question, unity, and they have to be 0 everywhere else. And so if you look at node number um, 1 in this particular case, the, x co the y coordinate of that is 1. So this is 1 or L, I guess. L over L is 1, and so U2 minus U2 is 0, so the value of displacement of that node is going to be 1, and of course it is. Likewise, if you take uh, the coordinate of this point as Y equals 0, then this term drops out, and the displacement at the bottom node is displacement 2, and so it satisfies that. Um, we can take <coughs> derivatives of that just by differentiating it, the only term that's left is this derivative here, so it becomes 1 over L u1 minus u2, which is this term here. And if you want to split this into a matrix relationship, we can write this uh, scalar as two vectors by just uh, rewriting in this form. So the A matrix in this particular case is actually 
um, the same as one that we've seen in the past. Um, and then if you substitute this expression for a into our relationship here, this is just elastic modulus, and you end up with this expression. You do the uh, matrix multiplication uh, to be able to get the components to come out of it, which is a 2 by 2 matrix. And then you do the integration on each of the terms. The integral of 1, of course, is just equal to um, L between the two limits of 0 to L. And so this becomes L and uh, takes care of this lower value here. And so you end up with a matrix, which is uh, a stiffness matrix in this particular case, which is identical to the one we've had before, identical for flow. So this 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1 has all the nice properties of, uh, uh, of the, the second order matrices that we've talked about. So positive definite, so non -zero, no zero terms on the leading diagonal, no negative terms on the leading diagonal, um, and typically with a dominant uh, strong diagonal compared to the, the off-diagonal terms as well, so it's relatively well behaved. And um, if you want to then assemble it into a, a, a global system, then you can just do exactly what we've done before. You remember that we take these and we use the template on global nodes 1 and 2 to calculate the stiffness matrix which represents these, which link global 1 and global 2 and it would be these particular terms, you know, 1, 2, 1, 2, and the point place that they go is right here to link magnitudes of forces that represent no degrees of freedom 1 and 2, both in terms of displacements and in terms of forces. And the second component that we pull in uh, links the magnitudes for 2 and 3, which would be these terms, which would be 2 and 3, 2 and 3, and the components that go there are just these. And so with that, uh, you, you solve them. You put boundary conditions. So this is a column with a force of 5 acting downwards. It's uh, twice as stiff on the lower element than it is on the upper element. The lengths of these are both 1, the areas are 1, and if we do that, then if you <coughs> substitute different values of modulus in here, you just get this factor of 2 for this lower part and a factor of 1 for the other. And then all you have to do is think about how you would go about solving them. What, what do we know and what we don't know? In terms of constraints, what have we done? We fixed this base, so this displacement, I guess it is ux, but it's ux at node 3, has to equal 0. So it's the same as a kind of a no-flow uh, boundary condition in some respects. Um, and so we've defined that to be uh, 0 displacement. And the other components are that we'd like to be able to figure out exactly what the other ones are. So we know that we've prescribed a force here. We've prescribed a displacement here, and so we know this term, and we know this term, and we like to be able to solve it. The same applies as before. If you have a force acting out of this element and acting into this element, by definition, <coughs> the sum of forces is zero. And so this term, if it's not prescribed as an internal force, is always going to be equal to to zero to be able to, to solve for that. So we know that, that magnitude. And so what we know are we know um, a force at the top, which is F1. We know a displacement at the bottom, which is U3. And we know that this is going to be zero. So we have enough now to be able to solve uh, the system of equations uh, just by, by rearranging it. Um, what we also notice is that since we prescribe this displacement on the bottom, then we actually can ignore that, oops, I can't draw very straight. We ignore that expression on the bottom, and we just solve for the other components which are, are present. Because we have an unknown in this expression that we'd like to be able to avoid. So what do we do? We take this, we multiply by the components in this column, 
and we move it over to the right hand side, left hand side. And so those would be 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times minus 2 is also 0, and 0 times 2 is also 0. So we haven't changed things. Uh, but actually, to be able to solve this, we only have two unknowns to solve for, and we solve it for those. And so you can do the simple inversion by uh, inverting that matrix, or you can take it on trust as these are the actual magnitudes. You can put them in and make sure. I guess if you substitute in the magnitudes, uh, actually it's not so easy to do that, is it? Well, so. so you invert this matrix and you end up with two different displacements coming out. There. And then uh, you need to figure out whether that's correct or not. So what do we have to satisfy? Well, we said that if something is in equilibrium, then, uh, or if something is not moving, if we're satisfying the principle of virtual work, then it's physically it's static. And so if we have this system with a force acting down on it at this point here, You'd expect that the reaction at the base, at force 1, should, oh, I guess it's the wrong way around, this is 1 and this is 3, that these should be equivalent but opposite because it's a vectoral quantity and it's acting in the opposite direction. And in this, <coughs> I'm not sure what I've done, but I've described, so this is the, 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 the global axis is up this way, so a positive force would be positive upwards. Right? So this is the, the coordinate direction is in the, in the y. So this is minus 5. And since this is up, this is equal to plus 5. So we'd expect that is the case. The other thing I suppose we'd expect is that we said that we made this thing out of two materials. And so this is twice as stiff as this material. And so if this force is being applied here, you know, if you take a section at any point, <coughs> presumably, to, if you try and write equilibrium, the same force is going to be acting up as down. So the force is the same all the way through this. And so the displacement that you'd get from this, you'd imagine if this is softer, is two times the amount that you get from this. This is the displacement you get. And so if you look at these magnitudes, what are they? The displacement at the top goes down minus 15 over 2. Well, of course, does that make sense? Physically, it doesn't, right? It means it's turning itself inside out. It means it's gone down. Um, so the length of these things, do we put a number in? I pr presume it's 1. Lengths were 1. And so it means the top has gone down 15 halves, so 7 and a half. So it's minus 7 and a half down from where it was. These are the change in displacement, not the, uh, the, yeah, the displacement from its original location. And so this is obviously nonsense because we've used this, um, a number for the modulus, which is a, a stupid number. So these would be in newtons. This would be in newtons per meter squared for um, the modulus. And we've just used a number which doesn't make any sense. But the point is that this is the displacement of the top. This is the displacement of the interior node. So I guess the difference in those displacements between those is just the difference between them, which is just um, 15 minus 5 over 2, 10 over 2. And so the compression of this one is 10 over 2. Again, it's nonsense. Of course, if you use something which is 10,000, a modulus of 10,000, it would be a number that makes sense. And um, this one here, between u2 and 0, which doesn't move, the displacement here is just 5 over 2. And so it makes sense in terms of the magnitudes of the displacement relative to each other. Um, you could check what the stresses would be and therefore what the, the compressions would be uh, just by using Hooke's law. And you could check this as... Um, so sigma equals d epsilon. So this, uh, if we divide, um, no. yeah, so this is a stress. If we multiply uh, a stress 
by area and this of course is epsilon is equal to displacement over length and so in other words uh, what am I trying to do? Oh, it actually it's, it's, so this is now a force we said the force is equal to 5 um, this is equal to 1 this is equal to 1 also and so I suppose that uh, the, the displacement has to be equal to 5 uh, multiplied by this by 1 uh, why isn't that working out uh, so this is force force is equal to stress times stress multiplied with both sides by this so that's the force this is the modulus, this is the strain, um, yeah okay I guess it's 10 over 2. So this is 10 over 2 which is <coughs> 5 over, zero, over 1, yeah, so this is 5. So the displacement here that we get from using this expression is exactly the same as this magnitude here, it's the compression of this top one which is just equal to modulus of 1. If you use the value for um, the modulus here, instead of 1, you take it to be equal to 2, then it ends up being uh, 5 over 2, which is uh, also the correct amount, which is half of this amount. So you can calculate whether the, you have the right shortening in the system as well. And I guess the final part is that if you now want to resubstitute into this, you can solve for the one remaining component which you didn't have. We know this displacement, we know this displacement, so now if you substitute into here and multiply through, it allows you to be able to calculate this force here, which ends up being exactly what you think it would be based on equilibrium. And so those are the, the components to satisfy. So it's really no different from being able to define things before. The analogs, if you like, are that you remember that when we had internal uh, nodes, we always said that the fluxes at internal nodes, if we're solving Q equals KH, then the fluxes all sum to each other. Mass in equals mass out is really what that's saying. And likewise here, at nodes, if you don't prescribe internal forces, um, there is no net force there because the, that node is in equilibrium. So the force coming out of one element and going into the other element have to directly counter each other as a, as a, a balanced reaction, basically. So that's it. So you'll see that uh, what we have are the, the system of equations which are relatively similar to what we've dealt with before. And so you can do these, own, these things for yourself um, to be able to figure out whether they work or not. So, the, so we know then if we plotted, uh, let me move that up so I can do it. So if you plotted for this element, the magnitudes of displacement how are we going to do this? Yeah, okay, let's do this. so if you plot displacement uh, which is coming down here versus location which is y what would this physically look like? well this doesn't move uh, there's some displacement going on here which is, what did we say this was? This is 5 over 2. It's 5 over 2. And this next one is, so what does it do? It does this. So in other words, this is the geometry that we have. So clearly within this first element, we have a linear distribution. Um, why do we have a linear distribution? Shape functions, yeah, linear shape functions. And so in this second one, we have a 
another linear distribution, but twice the gradient. And so you can make the same argument. So I guess the, then the question is, do we help ourselves by using more? What if we use ten elements in that system? What would be the the geometry we'd end up getting? The same geometry, or would it be something different? So when we did the Navier-Stokes problem last time, you remember we talked about this um, velocity across the width of this flow. It should be parabolic. We used a couple of um, triangular elements like this, right, to be able to represent this. And we ended up with a velocity of 4 here, and a velocity of 3 here-ish, and our geometry looks like this. And so clearly in this case, where we have this geometry which is driven by the, well, this velocity profile which is driven by the physical system, uh, we get a better result if we use much more elements, and that's why the numbers we got out of this were not <coughs> bad, but they weren't quite correct. In this case, if you use 10 elements to do that, all you'd do was you'd put up uh, a series of displacements that exactly overlie this line. So it's just the geometry of this particular system, not the finite element system, but the physical system, is that forces are constant within each of these two blocks, uh, and they're equal to each other. No matter where you cut it, they're the same, and therefore the compression or the strain in each of those has to be the strain as well. So the bottom line is you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't gain anything by using multiple elements. You'd actually just cost yourself a lot more work if you're doing it by hand or computer a lot more work. Okay? So um, if you want to be able to solve two-dimensional problems, I'm not sure whether we'll get through this to, I guess I can't log on to um, Hammer for whatever reason. So let's just strike out and see if uh, we can talk a little bit about this. So when we talked about two-dimensional elements for flow problems, um, we now know that this stiffness matrix we can always define as being equal to uh, an integral. And so long as we can determine what these individual sub-matrices are, uh, then we should be able to figure out what this is. And the only difficult sub-matrix, if you like, is the one that relates displacement gradients um, to nodal displacements. This is a simplification. This is the same as, I guess, this is modulus. Sorry, strain, rather. And so now, previously what we had was we had magnitudes of gradients of concentration or gradients of head which were defined in each of the x and the y directions. Um, if we knew what the shape functions were to be able to define that, we could take derivatives, we could write the uh, displacements, if you like, in terms of the displacement at any location in the x direction is equal to a shape function multiplied by the nodal values of displacements. And if we know what these shape functions are, we could take the derivatives of them, and then we'd have those uh, terms that we'd be able to use in this global stiffness matrix. But you remember when we dealt with triangular elements, we never went there. We never developed uh, a shape function to, to define that. What we said was that we have a triangle, and that if we think of the triangle uh, laid on its side, We could think in terms of heads at each of these nodes, and the surface that would go through those was the equation of a straight line, which by definition a plane can go through three, any three points, arbitrary to find points. And so we never actually derived a shape function and never used it in this form. And so you can use the same approach in this particular case to look at the um, solid mechanics elements to be able to represent this behavior. And so here's the uh, arrangement. We define an element which, just like our uh, triangular element for flow, it's actually a simpler one, right? It's numbered uh, counterclockwise, just by convention. Nodes i, j, and k 
case, perhaps not a very good choice. The number, the degrees of freedom are numbered sequentially in x and y, x and y, and x and y for each of the three nodes in question. Uh, we have nodal coordinates for i, j, and k. It's not marked here, but we do. And from that, we can put together our shape functions, or our, our kind of uh, representative shape functions. So we can define the displacement at any point. So any point we choose in the element is a function of the, the equation of this plane. Right? So we know now that the displacement, say, in the x direction, if the height of each of these lines is equivalent to the x direction, then if you choose a point within this element, then the height of this plane at that point is going to represent the displacement of that in the x direction of that particular point. So that is exactly what this is saying. It's defining this displacement at a point in terms of where it is, the x and the y coordinates, and also the mean set from where it goes through the origin, where x and y equals 0. Just like the, it's just like the equation of a straight line, but it's the equation of a plane. We can do the same for displacements in the y direction. I guess we should probably note that this a here obviously is not this a here. This is just a constant that's defining the behavior. And uh, unlike in the case of where we dealt with uh, flow problems, we had, for instance, a gradient of head in the x direction. We had a gradient of head or concentration in the y direction, but nothing else. When we talk about strains, we have both of these normal strains, the shortening in the x direction, how much it contracts, so just by definition, right? If you feel like prefer finite di differentials, this is delta u. So the strain in the x direction, if this is x, is equal to change in length in the x direction over the length, which if it's finite, it's a finite differential or infinitesimal differential, it's the displacement in the x direction over an infinitesimal portion of the length. So this is exactly, these are kind of the equivalents of these terms of, in terms of what they mean. But we also have an extra term, and so this term represents the, the, the distortion of the system. And so, in other words, the idea is if you take a, a block, I didn't talk about it when we looked at the previous picture, and if you take that block so that you shear it, like a, putting your hand over a deck of cards, then you could also think about this as, instead of doing that, taking a block and stretching it into a diamond. Is that right? That's not quite right, is it? What did I just draw? Okay. So in other words, if you take this so in other words you take this point here Okay, let me start again. So this needs to come up here. This needs to go there. This needs to go there. That's better. Okay. So you see this prismatic shape, which it's now in. If you rotate this, it's kind of uh, counterclockwise, just rotate it, then it's basically exactly the same as this. It just hasn't kept register here. So the point is that this. Um, displacement that has occurred here, if this is the x-coordinate and this is the y-coordinate, this displacement here is a displacement in the x-direction, but it's occurred over length which is given by dy. And so this term here, basically if you take it in radians, is the angle in radians which exists here. Likewise, this angle here is d displacement of this point going to this location here, 
over base length, which is this. And so the extra terms that come into it, which don't exist in these other expressions, merely account for this stretching in this direction, stretching in this direction, and the shear distortion that occurs, which together allow you to um, deform shapes in the ways that we might. So we have this extra term which we have to deal with in terms of um, shear displacements. And so what we notice then is if you take this expression for displacement in the x-direction and take the derivative with respect to x, the only term you're left with is this. If you take the displacement in the y-direction and you differentiate with respect to y, the only term you're left with is this force. And if you take each of those and do the cross derivatives, displacement in the x-direction uh, with respect to y, I guess, would be this term here, left of the c. And the displacement in the y-direction with respect to x gives you this term here. And so if we know the equation that defines this plane both for displacements in x and y, then as a function of just the slope of that plane, we can get the magnitudes of these shear strains. And these shear strains are, are what we're going to want to be able to put together because we know that this matrix here links strains with magnitudes of nodal displacements. So this is what we're after. If we know that we can get strains, which if we write this out in longhand, we'll have a strain in the x direction, a strain in the y direction, and a shear strain. And so we know that these individual components, this is going to be B, this is going to be F, and the bottom one's going to be C plus F. So that's where we're going with this. So we know that we can get the left-hand side of this just from the geometry of this uh, plane that we hope we can figure out um, for the, the element. And if we have that, then we can constrain it maybe with the magnitudes of the displacements at the particular nodes where we know what they are. So that's the, the game we're basically playing. So we have the ability now to get the dis displacement gradients here. So the other, aside from this, is that these elements are often called constant strain triangles. They're called constant strain triangles because if we define our displacements in some way that they vary according to this linear distribution over the element, like I drew here, if you take the derivatives of these in x or y, then a plane will always give you a constant magnitude. And so anywhere within the element, the strain in the x direction, the strain in the y direction, and the shear strains have to be constant. Hence the whoops. Hence the, the terminology for this as a as a constant strain triangle, which I didn't mention. Alright. So what we're we gonna do? Well, we have each of these, well, we're gonna do exactly the same as we did for flow problems. We realized that when we had flow problems, we could define the displacements at at least three points in the element. We know that the displacement here is in the x direction is u1, the displacement here in the x direction is u3, and the displacement here in the x direction is u5. And so we could write this equation three times with three different values for these displacements and solve for the three unknowns in this expression, because we know the locations where those displacements are, and the only thing is we don't know a, b, and c. And so that's exactly what we do. So we write the equation once, and we get it for the degree of freedom at node 1 in the x direction, and at the nodes where that is applied, 1, xi, and yi. We do it at the second node for the, the displacement in the x direction um, at node 2. I can't get them both on at the same time. And then we do it again for this location, which is u5, which is this. And these are the particular coordinates of, of the... We know all of the values of these. We presume that we know these. And so what we want to figure out from the three equations are these three unknowns. It's exactly the same problem as we had before. Uh, won't go through it. You uh, write it in matrix form in equation 9. Um, you invert it to be able to define A and B in terms of these uh, matrix coefficients. You'll note that before, okay, sorry, 
B and C. You note that we need these two components here defined. We never actually need the values of A or D. So A or D never exist in these. So we need B, which we have, and C is a portion of the shear component. And they're just a function of the coordinates of those individual nodes, nothing more than that. This is 2 times the area of the triangle, which you can get from the, the determinant. Um, you could write it out in longhand if you wanted to. So in other words, if you want to know what the displacements are in the x direction, this is just writing it out as this original equation, which is equal to uh, a times bx plus cy. And so you can get it from the nodal values just by, by using these displacements, multiplying by the terms in this expression, and you get that. I don't think you need to do that, because otherwise, actually, we don't need, to, we actually never need this term, I don't think. We need these two other terms, but not this first term. And uh, what else do we need to do? Well, we know that the magnitude of the strains are given by the gradients of displacements, which we've already said is going to be just the, the magnitude of this, this term here, which we know from this expression. And so we have that straight away. And so we're going to use that in some way. So we've done that once. We did it for um, the displacements in the x direction. And that allowed us to get these components. We can do it for the displacements in the y direction now. Define the displacements at nodes 1, 2, and 3 in the y direction. Know where the locations of those points are. And then solve a system of three equations to do that. That's exactly what this is here, this statement here. Instead of u1, it's now u2, u4, and u6. These are, again, the same nodes of the same, sorry, coordinates of the same nodes, and it allows us to be able to calculate what these are through the same manipulation. And so from that, we get a, strain, uh, a relationship which links nodal values of displacement, in this case, in the y direction, with the values of these variables don't really care what D is, but we are going to care what these other two are. And the reason we care what those other two are is that if we look at what these strains are, you'll remember that back here somewhere, we defined them as equal to strain in the x direction is B, strain in the y direction is F, and then C plus E. B, F, and C plus E. And so then all we're doing is wanting to put together the individual components into some relationship which links displacements with strains. And that relationship is this A matrix. We write displacements out in terms of um, their sequence. So these top two would be given by the magnitudes of displacements in the x direction at node 1. Sorry, not right, right? So this is node 1. x top 1, y. This is node 2. And this is node 3. Or I guess we called them i, j, and k. And uh, so when we put these things together, all we're doing is we're taking out of this matrix the magnitude of b, which would be these terms here, multiplied by displacements 1, 3, and 5. Not 1, 2, and 3, but 1, 3, and 5. And so the components that go in are just that relate to degree of freedom 1, degree of freedom 3, and degree of freedom 5. Um, likewise, when we do it, I guess it's easier to do it to here. F is just this multiplied by this, so you know that it's going to go in this point here. This multiplied by this, so you know it's going to go here. And this is a product of 
And then not surprising when you do it for the case where you have two of them together, you take some of them out of here, which are going to go in the same locations directly underneath these, right? So it's going to be B21, B22, and B23. So these just uh, are differences in coordinates, nothing that. And then the ones that represent C are going to be the ones that go in the other physical locations. So we end up with a, a matrix which links these two. Um, and then the rest is just to, uh, to do the final manipulation, and that is to realize, we haven't really introduced it here, uh, we'll, maybe we'll talk about it a little later, is that we have two um, requirements to be able to satisfy. If we want this <coughs> stiffness matrix, we have something that links strains to displacements, which is this relationship here. And we also have a constituent matrix. Not quite as simple as in the other case. It changes whether we look at plane strain or plane stress. Don't think you need to worry about that for now. Um, but it's a function of Young's modulus. It's a function of Poisson ratio, not viscosity. And Poisson ratio, etc. And links magnitudes of strains to magnitudes of stresses. So if you put these together, you can actually figure out exactly what the form of the stiffness matrix is going to look like. It's going to get complicated because it's quite a big matrix, obviously. But there are a couple of things to note, I suppose, that's useful, is that um, the D matrix, which is what this is, is constant, typically chosen, so it's constant over the whole element. And so that's one simplification. It could vary in space, but uh, let's assume it doesn't. And also, the A matrix, just as in the case for a flow element, is given by uh, the magnitudes of the differences in coordinates. And so the differences in coordinates are clearly constant within this matrix, and so the A matrix is also constant. And so the bottom line is that this integral can go outside. And so the conductance, the stiffness matrix, is equal to A transpose dA, times the integral over the volume, which is just the same as uh, the area of the triangle multiplied by the thickness. And so you don't need to do the inter integration, relatively trivial integration in terms of what it means. This integration obviously is just the, the volume of a, a unit thickness prism, which is this, the height of the triangle. And from that, you can use it to be able to put together the, uh, the stiffness matrix and solve the problem. And I won't go through that because you might have time. But that's basically the, the deal, is that uh, for these systems now that have more than a single degree of freedom per node, they are um, they're scalar quantities. And so we have to, to be able to reorder the matrix to be able to accommodate that. We didn't really have to do that here because our choice of how we define the um, the A matrix, the strain displacement matrix, uh, was already ordered in terms of nodes 1, nodes 2, and nodes 3. And so um, the rearrangement that we did last time when we talked about Navier-Stokes equations, because we derived it in a different way, we don't actually have to do, do this time. And uh, this description, there's actually just a quick derivation of, of how to be able to calculate what the stiffness matrix was, is, and how to solve a very simple problem using that. And I, I want to.